purposely. Your life, God's purpose. Listen at onpurposely.com. The last year I've just gone through transformation. I found a wonderful widow's organization that has uh, just empowered me to just really lean into the Lord and pursue Him for my future, for my family, for myself, and with the exception of losing my best friend. I mean, obviously, I would love to have him back, but outside of losing him, I would not trade these past 20 months for anything because of the way that I've seen the Lord pursue me and me surrendering fully to Him. Her name is AJ Strout, and we are back with part two because a conversation with her is so rich that, of course, it spans two weeks on the Passion Meets Purpose podcast. If you haven't listened to the first episode, I highly encourage you to go back um, and hear about how she fell in love with her husband, Steve, and their three beautiful children and some of the challenges that they had already overcome because that conversation is really the precursor to what you're going to hear today. I do want to give you a disclaimer. This episode is hard. It's hard to listen to. It's hard on my heart, especially because it involves the fact that AJ is now a widow. Steve passed away from multiple myeloma cancer, and we begin our conversation with her talking about when he received that diagnosis, and she shares about um, how, how hard it was to say goodbye. And you will also hear the beautiful, redemptive pieces of her story and how she knows Jesus more and better today than she ever has, and how she's honored to share about her husband's legacy and his story and the way that God has shown up for her. She will. She says that anytime she has the opportunity to share her story, she will, because she's already seen how it has helped others. So um, that's your disclaimer, difficult conversation, but so worth it as most difficult conversations are. Please welcome my friend, AJ Strout. I'm just so grateful that you're willing to share the story. So, you know, you build this dream house and I'm sure that you had pictures of you and Steve sitting on the porch when you're old and gray. Mm-hmm. And how long after you began building it, did you receive his diagnosis? Um, we, we were actually almost done. Um, one year to the day that we had moved down here. Well, Steve, Steve got sick and we thought it was COVID. He was achy, uh, not feeling well. I'll spare you all the details, but he, he was at the place where he needed fluids and I needed to take him to the hospital to get fluids because he wasn't keeping anything down. And it was one year to the day, our one year anniversary of moving to the beach. We were a month or about six weeks away from closing on the house. Take him to the hospital. He's sick. We've had negative COVID tests, so it must just be some kind of bug, but he needs fluids. And so they ran his blood work because he couldn't keep anything down. They, they decided to do a CT scan of his abdomen. And within two hours of being at the hospital, he was diagnosed with kidney failure. That was the first thing that came back from his blood work was he needed to have dialysis immediately and they needed to do further tests to see what kidney damage had been done. And then the CT scan came back, and I'm standing next to him. He's, you know, in in the bed, and the head ER doctor comes in and sits down, pulls up a chair and sits down, and I was like, boy, this is not good. And she said, you know, we got his CT scan back, and everything abdominally looks fine, but there are lesions on his hip bones and on his spine that are indicative of multiple myeloma cancer. And my knees buckled and my precious husband who just received just this devastating blow held me because that is the same rare blood cancer that took my dad. And so uh, I really, like, Steve was positive. And and sure enough, like, throughout that week, it was determined that he did have multiple myeloma cancer. His kidneys were completely failed. And so dialysis was now a new part of our life. He had to have it 
three times a week. He would go in center and have dialysis, and then he would go have chemo twice a week. So it was a full-time job between chemo and dialysis. But I also knew the language, and so I thought there was a benefit to that. I knew what multiple myeloma was. I didn't have to sit and research. I knew it. And so I really thought God was going to redeem multiple myeloma in our lives. You know, when my dad was diagnosed, they gave him three to five years. When Steve was diagnosed, they said, there's no timeline. Like, multiple myeloma has come so far, you'll have decades, especially with a stem cell transplant. And so we pursued that, and he spent weeks and weeks in a hospital in Arkansas uh, getting his stem cells, having the stem cell transplant, and he went into remission for about a month before the cancer started coming back. Um, and I trained to be a dialysis nurse, basically, and I was doing it at home. And so um, we felt like we had gotten to a place where it was somewhat manageable. Okay, we can manage dialysis at home. It was just going in for chemo once a week. And then he just had really bad abdominal pain. And he fought, you know, he fought for 10 months, but took him back to the hospital. And the last 11 days of his life were in the hospital. And he went downhill fast. And he passed away in June of 2022. You and I were actually together because yeah. the you thought, you know, he still wanted you to live your life, right? Like, and yeah. and so, you know, you were with him in the hospital. You didn't know, right? And so no. you, and there's a Christian radio broadcasters conference also in Florida, not that far yeah. from his hospital, right. a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Five hours. Five hours. And so you so, went to the yeah. conference. This is something we all do. Mm -hmm. This is where you guys fell in love. You fell in love at the, yeah, yeah you fell in love at a radio conference. Yeah. And, um, and so all of us travel from all over the, the United States and we meet together at the end of May, beginning of June. And so we were all there. Yeah. And when I left, they were just doing exploratory things. You know, he has this abdominal pain. My mother-in-law was already planning a visit to help with the kids while I was going to be at this conference. So Steve was like, absolutely. Just keep going. Like go mom, you know, mom's here so she can help take care of me, take care of the kids. When you get back, I'll probably be out of the hospital, you know, yeah. so I went to the conference. And instead, I don't remember what day it was, might have even been the first night, he had a cardiac event because of the dialysis. Yeah. I mean, it, it was like my life just flashed before, our, our life just flashed before my eyes. Because no one up until that point had said, this is the end. No one. They, t I mean, they said, you just bought decades with this stem cell transplant. And a friend of mine drove me back overnight, and I was at the hospital at like 5 or 6 a.m. the next day, and the hospitalist sat me down. Even if he would be able to have dialysis again, we would be looking at a long, painful death, which is what I experienced with my dad. And I knew I didn't want that for Steve. And his body at that point, Sarah, his body was done. I mean, he, he at that point, he lived 24 hours, and, in, and 24 hours later, his body just shut down very quickly. Your kids were able to see him say goodbye. Your son, Satchel, is so smart. He's so, he's just, all of your kids are extraordinary, each in their own ways. And when you were standing there explaining with Satchel what was happening, Tell me how that moment went for him. Oh, you know, it's, it's so fascinating how we're probably innately wired as men and women, boys and girls. His first question was, are we going to lose our house? Are we going to be okay? And that just caught me off guard. And, you know, I, I assured him that, you know, God would provide. And those weren't things we needed to worry about in that moment. You had friends with you as well. Can you share what it means to have some friends to support you through that? Yeah, yeah. So I am thankful that, you know, in, in the year that we were here or that, you know, before he got sick, that we formed a few friendships. All those girls, of course, asked me what 
I needed. Mm-hmm. And I said, I need to not walk out of that ho- the hospital by myself. I did not want to walk, leave that hospital by myself. So six of them showed up in the chapel and were waiting for me to receive me after I was finished with everything I needed to do after he passed. And we walked out of that hospital arm in arm, all seven of us across, uh, and they walked out with me together so that I wouldn't be alone. You also had every single radio programmer, music director, (laughs) artist, label mate, promoter, all Every every session there had Steve on our prayers, every song dedicated mm-hmm. to him throughout the entire conference. And you even had some some work colleagues that drove you there and they were with you, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you share what that meant? He was so deeply respected in the industry. I mean, it's just beyond overwhelming. Just thinking, I think what I think about when I look back at that is just how intricately God is in all the details of our lives and just stories of how Steve impacted these people, how these people impacted Steve and how everyone was basically in the same place praying out loud for him, for me, for my children some of the artists and, and friends were planning to come after the conference. They were going to come directly from the conference to say goodbye because we were trying to wait until Saturday to, to disconnect him. Um, and his body didn't, it, it, it was done. So it, he, it, we couldn't wait that long and had to disconnect him on Friday. But to see all the people that were going to caravan to his side to be there to say goodbye um it's just it's just overwhelming it's so much love it's so much kindness um from god to like those the last days the way it all laid out of every single person playing a specific role in those days was just i don't know how you couldn't see god all through it like he he was in every little detail And same Mm -hmm. thing with his memorial as well. I mean, I remember the guys from For King and Country came and sang and what you had so many artists that he really (laughs) helped further their careers. I mean, we could spend a whole other podcast just talking about how amazing (laughs) Steve is. Um, But you had you had an industry of people that loved him just on a professional level, but also a personal because he championed people. Yeah. He did. Yeah, we, it was beautiful. So the For King and Country guys, Rebecca St. James, uh, Darren from We Are Messengers, Brandon Heath, Toby Mack, John Reddick. Um, I feel like I'm missing somebody, but uh, yeah, those that's who performed. And then video messages came in from many more, which were just really sweet. That there, was be a, there. there was a really impactful moment with Toby Mack speaking to Mm -hmm. Satchel directly for Mm -hmm. someone that's not familiar with Toby's story. Can you share why that moment was really impactful? Absolutely. Um, Toby had just talked to Satchel beforehand, uh, just really encouraging him and using his own pain of losing Truett, of leaning in and saying, God, either you're real or you're not. And if you are, then speak to me. And he just really got into the word of God. And that's how God spoke to him in that season. And so from stage, he pointed Satchel out and just, you know, said, said, you can trust God, lean into him, get into his word, even if it's just a couple minutes a day. And it was, I mean, it, it impacted my son to have someone like that speak directly to him using his name. And I mean, he felt so seen by God in that moment. Satchel also spoke at the Mm -hmm. memorial and so did you. And, and you read from your family mission statement. Do you Mm -hmm. want to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So Steve was very strategic 
it's such an intellect. He was also a creative, so he was constantly thinking of ideas for businesses, for everything. And I remember one year, he as we, we always prayed and we always set goals at the beginning of the year, and he said, I really think we need a family mission statement. And I was like, our family is not a business. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved the intention of it. And so we prayed about words that we would want to include that were important to us in this family mission statement. And for me, one of those words was gratitude. Just again, talking about the discipline of gratitude. It was compassion. Um, curiosity was one of Steve's words. Present, celebrate, legacy. Those, those were the words that in different ways we both kind of came to the same like different words, but the same kind of version. And so, yeah, we are a family that practices daily gratitude regardless of our circumstances. We believe in living out the gospel by showing compassion to ourselves and others. We embrace curiosity to discover hidden treasures. We choose to be intentionally present, freeing us from past hurts and future fears. We will make time to laugh, play, and celebrate. This is the legacy we hope we will pass along to future generations. And so that's our that's our mission statement. And whenever we would make a decision, um, we would, you know, make sure that it kind of aligned with what our mission statement was. And, and so when we were thinking about moving to Florida, as we, you know, looked at that, we were like, let's, you know, does it line up with our mission statement? And it did. Do you love having that written down? Because now that Steve has been promoted to glory, you're able to continue to use it as a filter for your family moving forward? Yeah. I mean, it it almost like set this vision for me now as the leader of my house to have Steve's insight. And I still, to this day, as I make decisions, I haven't really had to make, you know, they say don't make any big decisions. Um after trauma like that. And and so I haven't, but I still, as I was, you know, even praying through my word for the year, I always will bring it. I'll bring the mission statement to mind and, and just try to continue to make decisions for our family through that lens, which is just awesome to have his, his vision just be a part of that. It'll always be a part of our family. It's been 20 months and you, the reason I asked you to be on this podcast is because you and I were, you know, talking work earlier today and you were sharing so much wisdom that I was like, AJ, more people than just me need to hear this. <laughs> you were saying that you are a different person with with yeah. the Lord yeah. than you were 20 months ago. And you were you were sharing about how you have struggled with control your whole mm-hmm. life and mm-hmm. it, times where you the more you've tried to control it. It doesn't, you're, I think you said like you're not very good at controlling your own life and none of us are. Um, right. How have you found freedom when on paper you could be bitter, angry, mad, like you're the opposite of that? Mm-hmm. Well, a couple of things. The first thing is the season that I went through with Cecily of the discipline of gratitude. I mean, it took a couple years, but it changed my perspective on the way I looked at life. And and that season had to happen before Steve passed away because I was able to walk through the passing of my best friend with being thankful in all circumstances. The same thing I couldn't be in the season with my daughter's diagnosis, but because I'd been practicing that for years at this point, I was able to walk through that season, and in that, the gift was seeing God show up every single day. And I think if my heart were hardened and if I were angry or bitter, I think back to the season with Cecily, and I probably missed a lot of seeing God show up in that season because I was angry, bitter, whatever, but it prepared me for this season of life where I am able to just not only see it, but I just sense, I sense him completely surrounding me. And again, coming back to the control piece every year, you know, we, we would pray about a a word for the year and Steve and I would have different words. And 
trust is a word that I never would consider because it's too hard. And that's not like, I, I just don't want to go there. And my, my counselor this year was like, this is the year 2024 is the year to trust, to fully trust. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. And January 9th, we had really bad storms um, in our area. The tornadoes destroyed Marina just a couple miles up the road. And as I get the kids out of their beds in the middle of the night and we go to our safe space, I just had just, just you know, given, given some of the craziness of life, I just had this fear and I was just like, I'm done. I'm done trying to control things because one thing, well, two things that I held on to was the, the safe peace haven of my house that we had dreamt of that we built and my children. Like those were two things I did not surrender to the Lord fully. Like I held them close and I remember sitting in our safe space. And I didn't say it out loud because my children were sitting there, but I mouthed it and I said it and I prayed it to God. They're yours. They're yours. Your will be done. I'm done trying to control or pretend. Again, we don't have that control. It's the illusion of control. Illusion. And I walked out of our safe space, changed. And that does, like for me, Usually that discipline happens over time, and and I don't know. I I just, I am a different person today, and I think part of it is choosing that word, choosing to trust Him fully, and not that I don't think that was a test from God, but it just put me in a position where I had to just surrender, and I'm so thankful for it. Like at the time, I was so scared. I was so scared that maybe my house would be destroyed in the tornado. Maybe one of my children would not make it if my house was destroyed. But even if, I trust you. I trust you with what you have for my future. And I've seen, I've seen like the last year, I've just gone through transformation. I found a wonderful widow's organization that has, uh, just empowered me to just really lean into the Lord and pursue Him for my future, for my family, for myself, and with the exception of losing my best friend. I mean, obviously, I would love to have him back, but outside of losing him, I would not trade these past 20 months for anything because of the way that I've seen the Lord pursue me and me surrendering fully to him. And he's just so good and he's so kind and he cares so much for all of us, for me, for my kids. I could tell you a hundred stories of how he has shown up in the tiniest of details and has ordered every day of my life in these past 20 months. I could probably share a story a day of how I see him, but I, uh, Satchel, my oldest is 16 and he's driving and that's scary. I never even let my husband drive because I wanted to be in control. And one day, you know, we were going to the market and I hopped in the car and he was driving and a work email came in. And so I checked it and he looked at me and he's like, mom, you're on your phone. Like, yeah, I'm not driving. (laughs) And he said, yeah, but you're, you're not holding on, like, you're, you're okay, you're, you're not holding on, you're not, and I was like, buddy, you have given me no reason not to trust you, and God has you, and I don't have to fear anymore, and he was used to a mom getting into the car that was white-knuckling and second-guessing every move and trying to be control from the passenger seat, and to, to like, for him to notice it visibly, like, mom, you're different. Mm. And the freedom, like it feels so like I, I, it's, it's so hard to really describe, but it feels so good to not be held by that fear. You recently went to a conference with that group of widows that you shared. I think it was called Invited. 
The conference was invited. The ministry is Never Alone Widows, and I would recommend it to anyone who knows someone who has been widowed. This is a beautiful ministry that is really changing the lives of widows. And we'll link up to that in the show notes for anyone that wants to know more about that organization. AJ, I'm so thankful that you are so open with your story. Um, You recently said that anytime you get invited to share it, the answer is yes. You told that to God. The answer is yes. How come when you have to relive such hard things? It's too good to not share. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's so simple, like the gospel being good news, but I can't not share it. And if, you know, he has, for whatever reason, this is my story, but if my story can bring hope to someone, if my story can point someone to how good God is and how much he loves you, it is always a yes, a hundred percent. Whatever time I have to give to share my story with someone to just point to Jesus and his goodness and how he has surrounded us in seasons of hurt and hard. He's there. He loves you. He's crazy about you. It's always a yes to share my story. 